All right. Um, everybody, thanks again. Um, and just because we started recording, I am Sarah Boyce. I'm the Director of Research and Education at the Linda Laurie Nature Foundation. So tonight we're going to be talking about iNaturalist and exploring Nantucket uh, with iNaturalist. I'm going to um, assume that, uh, you know, this is a, a basic course where people haven't um, explored it before. And so some, if, if some of you have um, iNaturalist and have tried using it, um, so a little bit might be, um, you know, repeat for you or not new information, but I wanted to um, have this go as if everyone is brand new with it. Um, we're going to talk about a few different things. So how people use it, what it is, a little bit of the background of iNaturalist, how it's used um, broadly, how it's used on Nantucket, and um, kind of go through step by step um, how we use it. And there's a lot of functionality with it. And so this is how I use it and how, um, you know, kind of, um, but not my way is by no means the best way. Um, and then for those of you on as well, I was just saying this earlier, if you signed on earlier, um, we're going to pair this with a optional field trip where um, I will send an email to everyone that has registered with some suggested dates and times. And we'll pick a date and time that works for most people. Um, and we'll go out and use uh, work on using our iNaturalist um, apps together. Um, so keep that in mind. So as I mentioned, this is part of our community science workshop series. Um, community science is a way for people to learn about science and participate um, in science and learn about the natural world in a meaning, meaningful participation in research. And this is basically my slide where I have an excuse to show pictures of my son when he was tiny. Um, he, he's always been a community science participant. So um, our community science workshop series, we've already done one on eBird. We did one um, last month on precipitation with cocoa Raz, and now we're working with iNaturalist. Um, upcoming for next month, we are going to be looking at phen tracking phenology with Nature's Notebook, which is looking at nature's timing of, event, of natural events. Um, that's something I use a lot in my research. Um, and then EdMaps, uh, which is um, an invasive um, an invasive plant um, database and um, citizen science app that we use both locally as well as the state uses. Um, and so that one is going to be May nineteenth. If you have more questions about those, you can you can um, go to our website or ask me later as well. So um, I like to put up this infographic kind of figure I made. Um, thinking about community science. So si sometimes people call it citizen science. We like to call it community science. And at the heart of every community science pr is a program. And right now, when we think about community science, a lot of it is app-based. So, you know, using on your phones. But a long time ago, when I was first doing this work, we were, you know, doing um, volunteer trainings with paper data sheets. And what it basically, you know, the community science program is at the heart. And they give information, training, and education to the community scientists in that red. And the community scientists give back the information that they're collecting. And that's why that red arrow going back to the program is thicker. So basically, the programs rely on the volunteers to collect data. But then what happens to that data? That data goes to researchers, educators, land managers, policymakers. Um, so lots of different people use data of these different programs. And I have these arrows going back and forth in different sizes because information comes back to the program from researchers. What do you need more information on? Let's help get that data. Or what do you need more education about? Let's help um, provide those educational resources. So it's not just volunteers providing data. It's really a big cyclical process where we all participate in different ways in these community science programs. And today we're talking about iNaturalist. This is one of my most favorite topics. So I was really excited to come today to talk. So um, what is an iNaturalist? So this actually is a screenshot from the um, web, the web, uh, the, their website on a desktop computer. Um, and this great photograph of a mantid um, from India. So iNaturalist actually began as a master's project. Um, so two people, um, were at UC Berkeley, and this was their, their master's project. They had this idea that people could crowdsource biodiversity data and information. And I think it's so fantastic that this global phenomenon of a database started as a grad student project um, in 2008. And it wasn't until 2014 that um, California Academy of Sciences really adopted it, realized the benefit of it, and have institutionalized it. And the National Geographic came on in 2017 as a partner. 
And so the benefit of having those two, um, you know, the, the academic side and the National Geographic side means that this is an institutionalized program. It's not gonna go away when a grant cycle ends. It's not gonna go away because someone retires. So this is a great program to both participate in and to use data from. So um, what is iNaturalist all about? So this is a little blurb right from their website. iNaturalist is an online social network for people to share biodiversity information and to help each other learn about nature. So that's kind of the overarching maybe way a lot of people think about it. The other two ways people use it is crowdsourced species identification system. So the crowd, the, the big group of people will identify things for you. So that's one way people use it. It's also an organism occurrence recording to, tool. So if you even know what you're seeing, it's a way you can record your information. But the organizers and the founders, what they think their primary goal in operating iNaturalist is to connect people with nature. And I absolutely love this because that's one thing we say at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation all the time is that we're about connecting people with nature. So it's kind of a natural fit for me to love iNaturalist. <laughs> Their secondary goal from connecting people with nature is to generate scientifically valuable biodiversity data from these personal encounters. And I love that they put that their primary goal was connecting people to nature and the secondary goal was data collection because oftentimes it's the reverse. And so I think that that's um, one of the things I love about the heart of this program. And so we start from humble beginnings as a grad student project. Now there are 91 million observations globally. Um, over 344,000 species have been um, entered and identified in iNaturalist. And there's over 2 million observers. Um, and so this is just the, when you look at the main um, page on a desktop computer and you're looking at the map, all those red squares are observations. And so the darker the red, the more observations are in one spot. And the day that I um, screenshot this, um, there'll be like some of the species that have just been entered. So um, you can see that some of them are from July, 2021. Um, I actually screenshot this just a few days ago because I wanted to have the latest numbers. And so you can even see at this one, um, one screenshot, you can enter photos that you took last year. Um, it, anyway, I'll tell you all about how and why that's, that's important and interesting, but just um, the power of this much data about the biodiversity um, of our globe is pretty amazing. And it's all open source and free. So at its heart, this is the most basic way of how it works. I'm going to go into some detailed instructions for you guys, but this is, I like this little infographic because basically it's three steps and basically only two if you, if you don't want to do the last one. You record your observations that you see of anything that's alive. You share with other people. So you post it on to iNaturalist and then that could be the end of what you do, but you can also discuss it or identify other people's or to, you know, have some biodiversity interactions. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those options are, but it's a really easy um, way to kind of engage in community science, both for you to get information out of it, what did you see and helps you identify things, but also by contributing data to the biodiversity of Nantucket and, um, and the globe. And here's another little infographic, oops, that I took directly from the um, iNaturalist website. Cause I liked, I liked this thinking about the different steps or different things that are needed. So let's say you see this beautiful white flower over here um, and you want to make an observation. So first thing that you're gonna need is to know who you are. So you need an account. It's a free account. It's kind of like anything you sign up for. They just basically need your email and your name and a few bits of um, identifying information. Um, it no, wants to know what you saw. It wants to know where you saw it. So pieces of data about, so it's metadata, data about what you're seeing. Where you saw it, when you saw it, what you saw, and what's your evidence for seeing that thing. So in the olden days, if you saw a plant, or like I'm, I'm a plant ecologist, so I'm gonna say plant. If you saw a plant that you're like, someone should know this is here, you would write down uh, where you were, you would write down like detailed directions to your location, you'd write down the date, the time, 
Um, and then you'd write some evidence. So what else you saw around it? What, you know, write down all the de detailing characteristics of how you knew that that was that plant. But now we have smartphones. <laughs> so the wonderful thing, I mean, I, I, miss, I miss some of those, like taking your field books into the field with you. Um, and I definitely still have my field notebook with me where I, when I go places. But the power of data collection that we have in our hands every day is totally amazing. So this phone or any phone that you have, um, or even just your digital camera, will take care of a majority of this data collection. You know, with a phone, you're a fo you take a photo, so that will tell you that will be your evidence for what you saw. That photo will be geo-referenced, so it will tell you exactly where your location is, even if you don't know where you are. It's time and date stamped. And then um, the iNaturalist app will help you with what you saw, even if you aren't sure. Um, and like I said, it works on all devices. So you can use an iPad, you can use an iPhone, you can use um, you know, a Google device or any, a Samsung, anything you want. You can also use just your desktop. So if you have, um, a camera and you don't want to use a smartphone or if you have a flip phone or something, all you need is a, a way to take a photo and then you can enter your photos later um, on the desktop. And there's a little bit of different instructions for that. I'm not going to go over those today, but there are tutorials and little videos on the iNaturalist website that show you how to do that. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that if anyone has questions. So here's the quick and dirty of my instructions. I'm gonna go into a detailed instruction, but this is um, a series that I took with my son um, at the very beginning of COVID when we were all at stay at home orders. And I was trying to get my son who was in fourth grade at the time kind of involved in some of this. So we went out in the spring and one of the first things we see is this green plant. So you don't even have to know what this plant is. You're like, oh, I see something green, it's alive. We should take a picture of it to document that something is green at this time of year. So little Charlie goes over, takes his, the iNaturalist app, takes a picture of that plant, and then we upload it onto iNaturalist. And this happens to be one of our honeysuckles. It's Lanicera. So you can see, um, and I'll show you how to do all this, but um, we put it in, we have, a, there's a little map that shows us where we are. Um, it says that it's a honeysuckle. You know, Charlie wasn't sure which honeysuckle, so we just said honeysuckle. Um, and that's enough for now. And so that's like at the basic, that's all you have to do. Um, so it is pretty easy. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail. So let's say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go as if we're on a field trip right now. So we're walking around, let's say Squam Farm, uh, the Conservation Foundation property, and we see this really cute turtle. And we're like, well, this turtle is very charismatic. He needs to be on iNaturalist. So we take this picture and um, we pull up our, this is, this, this, these are screenshots from my phone. Um, and so it's gonna, you know, your observations might look a little different, but I thought this would be a nice way to see what the interface looks like. So you pull up iNaturalist, when you open the app, it will immediately go to this kind of page with um, how many, your last observations. So in this case, when I did this, uh, my last observations were Pennsylvania sedge and Japanese honeysuckle. All right, so you're gonna hit the little camera picture, so observe, and you're given an option, I didn't take a picture, you're given an option to either use a photo that's already in your photo library of your phone or to take a new one. Um, and you could do either one. Um, and then you can, you just select, that's a good photo, I'm gonna use it. And then um, you get this page. So you have the photo, it's at the top that you've already um, added. And then this is the, the meta, what we call metadata. So data about the point you're collecting. So you can see at the bottom there's, um, it says the date, this was April, 2020 when I made this series. It has, it says Nantucket Island, but it also has the latitude and longitude of exactly where we were. The geo privacy is open. And so um, I could change that. If I didn't want anyone to know where exactly that turtle was, I could hit, um, close or um, I forget what the other term is, but to kind of, it would roughly put the turtle where it is, but not the exact point. But I'm fine with this turtle being in the exact point. Um, it's not captive or cultivated. So this is a wild animal. 
Um, and then there's different projects, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But basically, those are all things that are automatically filled. And so this is the part that I think a lot of people find the most interesting. So what did you see? So this is great because even if you aren't sure if you want to upload this to iNaturalist, this is a way that will help you get started with identifying something. If you know that's a turtle, but you don't know what kind of turtle it is, um, this is a great thing to do. So you could, what did you see? And this is the amazing power of data. So iNaturalist, as you saw, there was um, how many 900 million observations? Based on the sheer number of observations and the number of positively identified species, the algorithms will look at your picture and say what they think it is. And because iNaturalist has such a rich data source to draw from, it's often quite accurate. The other thing I love about iNaturalist is it's not afraid to say what it doesn't know. So it uses your location to think what are the likely turtle species. And then based on the identifying characteristics of this species, it'll probably get you know close to the answer. So here's, look, it even says, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Chrysimus. So it knows it's a painted turtle or it thinks it's a high likelihood of painted turtles. And then it says, here are top 10 species suggestions. And I chose, yes, it is, oh wait. So before, then you can see the choices. And if you wanna get more information on the choices, you click the little eye and you can see, oh, here's some information about painted turtles. You can see multiple pictures, you can see descriptions. You can see a map of where the species distribution is to see, well, yeah, it's pretty likely that that's a painted turtle. So then you can click that green button that says select painted turtle, which is what I did in this case. So you click painted turtle and I didn't take any additional notes. You can type in notes there and then you click share and that will automatically put it up into the iNaturalist sphere. So it's syncing in this picture. You can imagine waiting for the painted turtle data to upload. Um, and then what I wanted to show you too is what happens later. So this is this last screenshot on the far right is a, is eight days later. So I had um, identified it as painted turtle, and then this is the other big part of iNaturalist is the crowdsourcing of identification. So first the algorithm suggests something, and I say, yeah, I think you're right. It's a painted turtle, and then there's other people who identify things. And someone else agreed with me. Great, they agreed with me. And then the last person said, you know what, it's actually an Eastern painted turtle. So you are right, but it's even more. So it's it's not Christmas picta, it's Christmas picta picta. And so then we agree. Um, and so the more identifications that agree with each other, the more strength there is in your observation. So flash forward to, I took a, um, a new screen, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I put, I clicked a new screenshot of this. This was from today. I mean, this is the same turtle, but I took a picture of my old um, observation because I wanted to show at the very top, you see that little green banner that says research grade? Um, that means that there's been enough positive identifications that now this is a research level observation. And that's an important distinction because when people use the data later, um, a lot of researchers will only use the research grade observations because there's confidence in that data observation. So when I look at this now and I see, um, I'm embarrassed to say that my, my, my handle for iNaturalist is called Act Nature Nerd because when I made it, I didn't intend it to be for my work use. And so, <laughs> but that's just what happened now. So I'm Act Nature Nerd, embarrassingly enough. Um, and you can see the map of all the Eastern painted turtles that have been um, found on Nantucket before. And you can see the date that it was observed based on when I took the photo and the date it was submitted. So I submitted it about eight days later. Um, and yeah, um, that's another thing. If you're going for a walk, you don't wanna stop every five minutes to like do a whole iNaturalist upload. I often take a lot of photos that I think of are things I want to record into iNaturalist and then I'll add them later because the photos are the piece that have the identify the um, geo referenced and the time and the date you don't have to do it at that exact moment so um 
And then when I look at my gallery of things I observed that day, you can see the Eastern Painted Turtle is right up there. I took this recently, so it says two years ago. <laughs> so it was two years ago that I actually observed that guy or girl, I don't remember. Um, and then you can see the Pennsylvania sedge I saw and the honeysuckle and the other things that I observed on that um, day in April. So um, in addition to how you observe, I wanted to see you to see what else you can get out of iNaturalist. So this is my, um, species, my individual page. Instead of having my actual name, I have um, like a nickname. A lot of people have nicknames. Um, for their uh, observations. You can add all kinds of information about yourself if you want to. I just haven't done that yet. But you can, what I love is for those of us who want to, you know, see all the things that we have um, seen, um, you, there's lots of different ways you can view your own data. So there's observation, there's all the observations, there's all the species you've looked at, there's things you've identified for other people. So I've only identified 27 things for other people. There's lists. There's um, lots of different things. So let's look at a few things. So this is my gallery. Um, so if I look at my species, what I find interesting is you can see the top species. So these aren't my photos. These are just the general species photos, but you can see the number of observations. So I think it's funny that I have my highest species that I have made the most observations of is Eastern tent caterpillars. <laughs> That's because I, I love them. I don't ever take pictures of the moth, just the caterpillars and the egg masses, but pink lady slippers, blueberries, turtles, um, deer are interesting. And I have an example later where I don't actually see deer, I see evidence of deer. And those are other things that you can take pictures of, but you can get a sense of what you're observing yourself by looking at how many things that you see at any given time. You can also look at your life list and you can look at it by um, tree. So like, I can see, I've seen 255 animals, but where's the plants? But I've seen um, 349 plants, which makes sense because I'm a plant ecologist that I would like to take pictures of plants. I've seen one protozoa that I don't remember um, what protozoa that is, that's pretty cool. Um, but then you can see how many like fungi, I've done 36 fungi. So I, it's just an interesting breakdown. Um, it's just kind of a fun way to see all your different things that you observe. Um, I can also look at a map view of all my observations. And so obviously for Nantucket, there's a lot of, it's a dark red because that's where I live. Uh, I've made tons of observations in New Hampshire. I was like, was like surprised at how many observations I made personally in New Hampshire. So that's been interesting. Last year we went to the Outer Banks, took a bunch of iNaturalist observations, went to a conference in Cincinnati three years ago, did a bunch of um, iNaturalist work. Mostly it helped me identify things when I was in a new location, right? I'm in a new location. I'm like, that plant looks familiar. And I add it to iNaturalist. It's something common there, but, um, but maybe not where I'm from. So it's both providing information on like providing data to the um, database, but also for me, it helped me being in a new place. What was I seeing? Um, and then this is just uh, when I look at my general observations, it, um, it shows you the most recent ones. So I actually haven't done any iNaturalist work in the wild because it's winter and I haven't gone anywhere where anything was blooming or anything, but you don't have to, right? Like you can take, I saw this Cooper's Hawk down on the docks. Um, I saw a house barrow when I was in Boston. Um, you know, there's just, there's lots of different things to see throughout the year. Um, and even though I'm a plant person, I tend to take lots of pictures of insects and caterpillars because they're things I don't know as much about. So I always want to know more about them. And that's just uh, my page. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how that we can, how anyone can use iNaturalist data. So for most people, like general public and people that aren't professionals, um, anyone can use iNaturalist data also. So you can keep track of your own observations like I just showed you with maps. You can also do calendars so you can see like when you're, uh, when you're making the most observations of anything. Um, you can get help from the community. So if you really want to have something identified, you can get help from the rest of the iNaturalist community. Um, you can also share your ex expertise by adding identifications for other things. Um, and then you can, you can't, there is a so social aspect to it. I don't often tap into that social aspect, but you can, you know, converse back and forth with other people identifying different things. For scientists and experts, this is a really rich data source. 
um, for lots of different things. There's, um, you know, conservation organizations, other people interested, researchers um, can download the data and in, um, in, there's an export tool that you can use to, to download the data to ask bigger picture research questions. Um, and then many scientists and taxonomic experts also provide lots of help identifying things. Um, many sci most scientists use the research grade, as I mentioned. So they often will preferentially identify the things that they care about. So there's, for example, there's like a praying mantis scientist who is like the top um, identifier of, praying, of mantid species globally because they care most about praying mantis or mantis species. And so it's just interesting, like the species that have a lot of identifications and it's because people are researching them and want them to be research grades. Uh, a lot of teachers use iNaturalist. It's a really great way to engage students because students can take a little bit of data on their own, but then they can tap into the rich um, backlog of information for other species. We've used this a lot um, during COVID actually with a lot of the um, seventh and eighth graders at our uh, middle school here on Nantucket. I used it with um, the new school when we work with them on um, different projects. So it's a really great way to work with kids. Um, and then land trust, we do a lot of bio blitzes around. And with we, the big we like land trust generally like bio blitzes to get a handle on biodiversity information. And I'm gonna talk about bio blitzes again in a second. And I just, for the scientific um, understanding of like how amazing this data, this data um, repository is, I guess, as GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So GBIF is like this clearinghouse for all biodiversity information. Um, if you go onto GBIF and I looked up, if you, if you can see my cursor, all I asked were papers that have iNaturalist research grade observations in them. And oops, there are 2,193 results. Um, so that means there's many, you know, the website says there's hundreds of papers, but by now there's like thousands of papers that reference iNaturalist data. They're used to look at as species, as um, you know, species ranges are changing with climate change, they're looking, they're using iNaturalist data to look at um, um, how, you know, species are changing. Just in this little screenshot, there's like gecko, there's terrestrial animals, there's beetles, and there's, what's the last one, bats, you know, really different taxa all being studied using iNaturalist data. So how do we use iNaturalist? So on Nantucket, we, but we definitely contribute to iNaturalist. And so some of these big picture research projects, our data might be part of, and we just never know it. By submitting data, you're automatically saying like, yes, my data can go into the commons and you know it's open source data. Um, we have embraced iNaturalist, particularly in BioBlitzes. So I'm gonna talk about a particular BioBlitz bio Blitz project that you all can join in a little bit later. But in 2020, when COVID first hit and we all had to shut down, we started the Linda Loring Nature Foundation BioBlitz um, during, um, we started it like in April that, cause when we realized school was gonna be closed for a while, we thought it would be a few weeks <laughs> and it, we ended up running this BioBlitz for like two months. Um, but it was a way that people could um, get outside and start collecting information, doing something, having a focus and an activity, but they didn't have to be in a group of people. Um, we also, like I mentioned, species range information. So looking at where, um, you know, how broad a species distribution is. Um, phenology, which I'm going to talk about next month in, in de more detail, but the timing of things. So if you notice something blooming in the middle of winter, putting it on an iNaturalist is really interesting. I know a lot of people saw uh, with our, we had a, no one remembers this now, but we had a really warm um, November and December, if people remember, and there were some days where people were saying their ornamental cherries were starting to bloom again. Um, it's a really great way to tell someone about it, right? Because it's kind of an amazing thing. And we know that that's happening more frequently as our climate is changing. And just taking a picture of it and adding it to something like iNaturalist, people will then use those data to, um, to see that kind of phenomenon and how frequently it happens. We look at property biodiversity information, um, like at Linda Loring. Um, we created a boundary around the Linda Loring Nature Foundation property. And so our property is considered a project now. So anyone who collects iNaturalist data within our boundaries, we get that data. 
So um, even if we have a lot of visitors who take walks on the property and they might use iNaturalist and they don't even you know, know that we also use iNaturalist necessarily, but we have their biodiversity, we have that information collected. Um, in this little map, um, all the different colors are different taxa. So green are plants, I think red is animals and blue is insects. I'm not really sure, I can't remember what the, um, the key is, but um, another really important thing is non-native species. So um, not so much on Nantucket, but the spotted lanternfly, which um, is an invasive insect that's becoming more and more prevalent, was first noticed in Massachusetts using iNaturalist. So um, there's a lot of research that has shown that um, uh, non-professionals are often the first discoverers of non-native species, and they don't really know it. So if pe the more people that use iNaturalist, you might be making a discovery you don't know you're making. If you're just like, wow, that, that's a really weird insect, I'll take a picture of it, um, then that might be an important piece of information. Um, in our, my own work, um, you know, sc scotch broom is a, a plant that I study and um, it's a non-native species that we have proposed for listing to the state. And um, in proposing this uh, species to the state for listing as an invasive species, um, among others, iNaturalist was one of the rich data sources that they used to show the spread of um, scotch broom throughout the coastal Massachusetts. Um, and so both our state and other states are really using the research grade data to um, make policy changes. And then of course, as I mentioned, educational opportunities. So we get kids out in nature, um, observing things and observing things in, in an individual sense and then being able to contribute those data to a larger whole. So I mentioned a bio blitz. And so I wanted to, um, I'm gonna go talk a little bit about bio blitz and then I'm gonna start showing some observations that we've made, but I wanted to make sure everyone knew what a bio blitz was. So bio blitz is a, a term that's used in biodiversity. It's a kind of event that has been broadly used for, I actually don't know the history of bio blitz necessarily, but I would suspect in the hundreds of years where there's basically an intensive survey of a defined area. So it used to be, um, well, basically it's as many, you inventory as many as species as possible over a finite amount of time. So usually it's like, when I lived in Connecticut, we had a bio blitz weekend um, and different, it's kind of like the Christmas bird count if you've ever participated where different teams have different areas they survey for. And there's people have different areas of expertise that will go to a, excuse me, go to different locations to look for those things. Um, and it's a way to involve community members and scientists and school groups. So usually, um, you know, it's a big community event. And so it's, it's a really fun way for a lot of people to get together and look at nature and count nature, but also it provides a, usually a pretty um, rich data set for people that, you know, the land trusts and things to, to use. But, um, you know, iNaturalist has really, embraced um, or been embraced by the BioBlitz community and become a really important tool. So maybe um, I didn't put this on here, but there's a, um, a BioBlitz called City Nature Challenge, which a lot of people have participated in, um, where there's different cities around um, the globe that are they do a BioBlitz using iNaturalist over a um, certain period of time. Um, the Nantucket Land Council and the Linda Loring Nature Foundation have collaborated on a bio blitz. And instead of being over a weekend or a week, we had it over the whole month of July. So I had mentioned before that we did the COVID, um, the COVID uh, bio blitz that started in April because that's when school was closed. But it's also not the best time to do a bio blitz, right? Like you think of if you're going to be looking at biodiversity and counting biodiversity, when are the most species around? So we know on Nantucket, um, the most people anyway are around in July and August. And it's true too for the species. So July is growing season. Um, and it's also when all the insects are out. So it's actually a fantastic time to do a bio blitz. So we had some specific questions. Um, so like how many different species are there? How many species can we find in July? Um, are species in which are most common? Um, are there invasive or exotic species? Um, unusual species? Um, are there rare or novel species? We, there was a hope that somebody would find something that's never been discovered before. Um, and then most surprising or intriguing. 
But the real goal was to get people out and about in nature and have people focused on the landscape. Um, and so I'm going to show you some of our favorite finds from the Bio Blitz, but I also want to encourage any of you to join in. Um, basically, all you have to do is have an iNaturalist account and then collect data during July. It could be anywhere on Nantucket. So even if you don't formally join the program, if you're collecting data on Nantucket in July, it will become part of our um, project. This Northern water snake, uh, Tracy Maliu, who is our vice principal of our um, the Cyrus Pierce Middle School, she entered that into the BioBlitz last year. That's a fat snake. Um, so this is what the project looks like. So if you do join officially the project, then you can see the project page. And when you're in a project, um, the, the data that gets submitted to the project still goes into the full iNaturalist, but it's just a way of collecting that information um, and in, or seeing the information in a different way. So the 2021 BioBlitz was a huge success. There was a goal of 800 observations and we had over 2000 observations. We had 117 people participate um, and 855 species in total were found. And so you can see just from this quick screenshot, there were bats, there were slime molds. I mean, who thinks, who's like learning about slime molds? Like, this is a weird thing. I wanna know what it is, right? Like um, the great golden digger wasps, the lesser meadow catydids, um, poison hemlock. I don't think that was poison hemlock. Hmm. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of diversity of the types of things people are collecting. I can tell from that, that bat picture that that's Danielle O'Dell's hand, um, probably when she was collecting bats uh, for the Conservation Foundation. So it's not like people gr grabbed bats and <laughs> took pictures of them, but it's a way too for researchers to keep track or to like have their um, species um, counted too. So um, this is the uh, full extent of the bio blitz. Um, there's two yellow kind of, um, blobs around Nantucket because the extent is Nantucket County as well as Nantucket Island. There are two geographic distinctions, but um, uh, all the dots, you know, all the points are different recorded points. So I'm, in, I'm excited that we had Tucker Neck this year. Um, we had some observations on Tucker Neck. Um, we have some observations in the middle of the ocean. And I will explain a little bit more about that. So some are actually fish species because people off the boat you can like uh, record a fish species but some are actually um, uh, recordings that don't have the exact location I'm going to explain that in a minute so if you kind of hold tight for that I'll explain why some some more observations are in the ocean instead of on the land um, when we look at some of the statistics or not the statistics but like the summaries of um, what was found my favorite is looking at the species because you can see um, the observations, there's 855 observations, but how many were, you know, half, about half were plants, there was about a quarter that were um, insects, there's obviously few mammals, um, because we don't have that many mammals, there were more birds and reptiles, you know, you can kind of see the breakdown of what people observed. But the other great thing about a bio blitz is you have leaderboards, and so this was became a really fun thing to try to be um, the most species or the most observations. So the person who was first was Chase and Chase was um, um, one of the field assistants for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. And you can see by Chase's numbers, especially of species, he had 229 species. So even like our second and third places, we were like a hundred species behind. So we couldn't catch up, but I was trying to beat Nick really hard. I, I was like really trying to beat Nick, but um, we were really excited, Rudy Rudy here, who was fourth, he was actually the top non-professional um, observer. He is an astronomer by trade and he was on the island off and on all summer. And every time he came, he became obsessed with the bio blitz. And so he, um, you know, really, um, really added a lot of species here. Helen Weeks was uh, a board member of the Nantucket Land Council. And she was a real champion of this project too. She went out a lot. And I happen to know Mary Longacre, if you know Mary, um, she um, uh, really said that, you know, she was home isolating 
for a lot of COVID and the BioBlitz was a way that helped her see her own yard in new ways. So she said she kind of got like a little crazy about um, turning over rocks and seeing how many species she could have just for her yard. Like she wanted to have a, a nice species list just for her yard. So it was really great like to realize that the BioBlitz really achieved those goals of getting more people to see things that they, differently than they had seen them before. Um, our top species were interesting. Monarch butterflies and common yarrow tied for first. Um, milkweed was close second. That makes sense for being in July. We had, a, you know, and, and sweet pepper bush um, also being up there tied for second place is not surprising because sweet pepper bush is very obvious and flowers in July and it's very, very smelly. So people really see it. So um, it's really great to see kind of like what the top um, observers were. And we had a little contest for that too. Like who, who what did you think were going to be like the top species? So I want to go over a little bit about what did we see and, you know, kind of how you can get some more information from these um, plants too. So um, some of these observations come from our original um, COVID bio blitz and then some are from um, the more recent bio blitz. But this is um, bear berry. So Arctostaphylus uva ursae, one of our common native plants on Nantucket, you can see at any time of So this is like the actual observation by uh, someone Posey. Um, and then you can see the map of on Nantucket of all the places on Nantucket that Arctostaphylus had been observed um, and recorded. You can see this is already a research grade observation. So this is like a solid, solid observation. Um, and this is from April, 2020. Um, I put this in here because I love this. Um, so this is a long-tailed duck. And what I really like about, um, there's a something, sorry, I can't see the very top of my own screen. Um, what I like about this is uh, this was just a, a random, you know, seemingly random duck. The person didn't know exactly what it was and they took the picture and submitted it. Um, and then if you look at the next page, you can see the activity, which means like, so the person, knew that it was a duck that was like it's a duck I don't know I'm not a birder I saw this duck and I just don't know don't know what it is so they put it on there um and then you can see all the different positive identifications from people all over the world so these aren't people that are definitely on Nantucket these are people that um you know know about birds they know about wading ducks they you know and can weigh in and now that this has you know multiple observations um it becomes research grade, so that becomes useful data. But also now this person knows that that's a long-tailed duck. They didn't have the information before. And you'll get a notification um, every time you have something that's positively ID'd. So here's an example of a non-living thing that I took. So this is one of my observations. I found an antler out at the Linda Lurie Nature Foundation and I took a picture of it. So this is, this I naturalize is strictly for living things. But things like feathers, eggs, you know, um, well, eggs are living things, but um, eggshells, uh, antlers, because it's identifying that this, this animal was here. Um, and so, um, an ant, you know, before I picked up the antler, I took this picture. So it was the exact location. Um, and so that's also research grade that it's a white tailed deer. Um, and yeah, so this is, I had that as an example of just, it's not alive, but you can take a picture of it. Um, this is some of our coastal things. I tend to also do a lot of beach combing photos when I'm walking my dog, because it's a lot of things that I don't always know what they are. Um, here's um, codium or dead man's fingers. All every Now that you see this, I'm like, everyone's like, oh, I've definitely seen that on the beach. Um, and what I want you to notice is that little pink exclamation point at the top of the page. So this identifies that this is an introduced species. So it tells you that this has arrived in the region by anthropogenic means. So there's, you know, it knows that Codium is not native to Nantucket. Um, and so it's interesting that it will tell you that. So you can get this information from your own observations. You might not know and go, oh, I didn't realize that. And then when you actually click on the Codium name, it brings you to some species information. So you can see for the Codium, the dead man's fingers, where else in the globe it usually is found. Um, you can find where it's native where, and where else it's been found um, and non-native. 
Um, here's another interesting observation. I tend to find these a lot. This is a praying mantis egg case. Um, so this is actually a Chinese mantis. You notice from the top, um, if you can see it, that this also has a pink exclamation point because there are no native mantid species on Nantucket. Um, but it is also research grade, so it's been positively identified. Um, so you can see this is the, the person, I had mentioned that there's a um, mantid researcher who identifies like every single mantid and it's that last one on this list, Mantodier. <laughs> Um, the person like identifies all mantids. So I suggested Chinese mantis and then I was confirmed. Um, and here's a picture of a Chinese mantis. You can see that when you go to the species page, um, you can see uh, the top identifier is Mantodier. There's also the top observer. Um, I'm, I'm feeling like I want to be the top observer. You only have to have more than 11. I can do 11 praying mantises. That'd be pretty cool. Um, and then you could, what I liked also is you can see the seasonality. So I saw my observation was in April um, because it was an egg case. And you can see January through April, there's like a moderate amount of observations. That's because they're egg cases and not as many people see the egg cases. Then there's in June, like no one sees praying mantises and that's because they've hatched and they're super, super tiny. So no one ever sees them. And then there's a huge spike between basically August to October. And that fits with when the praying mantises or the Chinese mantises are at their largest size. So that's kind of an interesting thing to see that seasonality. Um, and then how, that's another reason why we collect this, these data, right? If we're starting to see really big mantises in July and June, um, that would be interesting information that would be um, useful. Um, and then the other type of observation is an observation of a vulnerable species. So this picture I took isn't a great picture, but this is um, Amelanchier nantucketensis, so our Nantucket shad bush. It is a considered a vulnerable or rare species. Um, on Nantucket, it grows prolifically, so we're not too, you know, we manage for it, but it's not a huge species of concern. But because, so this is, this is what it usually looks like. Um, so you have an idea of our shad bush. Um, but that VU at the top of the page is vulnerable. So it has a conservation status in NatureServe, which is the global um, or the national, I guess global, um, vulnerable database. Um, and so what you see is on the map, you see that even though this picture was from the Linda Lurie Nature Foundation, the dot is in the ocean and then there's a green fuzzy box around it. And that way it protects locations of vulnerable species. Um, so that's like a really beneficial thing. If you see something really rare, you can, you know, make sure that it is, um, you know, they don't give exact location information. Um, there is a caveat to that. It has to be in nature serve. So a lot of our state listed plants um, aren't, don't make it into nature serve. So they're, they will give like accurate point information. If you're worried about it, you can change the settings. Um, in your, when you um, upload the location information. And then lastly, or I don't know, I, I think this is the last one of my examples. Um, I took this picture and I thought it was good to show because the picture is of the bee, not the flower. So the real emphasis of iNaturalist is on native or not native, is on wild species. So we don't, while the flower is beautiful and I'm so proud of myself for growing this daffodil, I, um, I planted it, it's not a native plant, you know, it's in my garden. It's not necessarily, um, the interest is not in garden plants, but um, the bee that, the bumblebee that is visiting the uh, daffodil is a wild um, creature. So that's um, just, this was also to remind me to say that, you know, we had, we have some volunteers who were, who were there 12 and they were trying to take pictures of each other to say, Homo sapiens, why aren't there people in the in iNaturalist? And then, you know, you can't take, you don't want to take dogs and cats and things like that. Um, so the, the goal is really um, of uh, wild specimens. Oh no, this is my last one because I definitely had to save the best for last. Um, we had a lot of people learn about the dog vomit slime mold during our uh, 2021 bio blitz. Um, this is one of the most talked about of our <laughs> finds um, because 
it doesn't look like much, but if you've ever seen it in your garden, it's sometimes on mulch, it looks, um, it's like yellow and foamy looking. But we had multiple observations during the, um, the bio blitz, and this isn't a research grade one, but it was pretty funny because people were really interested and they learned about it. So it's like something you might not have cared about, or you might have looked at it and gone like, ew, that's gross, and like squirted it with the garden hose. But finding it um, and taking a picture of it and, and adding it made for some lively conversation for the bio blitz. So when we, and it makes sense because when we look at the species page for it, the spike, the, the highest likelihood of seeing it is in July, and that's when our bio blitz is. So, you know, we purposely picked the peak of dog vomit slime mold season for our bio blitz. So hopefully you too can observe <laughs> the, the most charismatic slime mold of them all. Um, um, and so with that, I hope the dog vomit slime mold in particular really encourages you to join us for um, iNaturalist in general, but certainly for the bio blitz um, in July. It's a, a really great way to share observations, contribute to biodiversity knowledge. Um, and then we are going to be having some, you know, group guided walks along with this to kind of explore different areas. Um, some of our goals for this year, we want to be, you know, kind of, it's always fun to like try to have numbers to beat and we did so well last year. But also thinking about um, areas that were maybe under observed. So parts of CO2 and Cascada, um, parts of Tom Nevers, there's, there were very few, if any observations, it'd be great to get back out to Tucker Neck. Um, so it's just kind of fun to think about if we can um, maybe have some targeted excursions in those areas as a group. Um, but then even just thinking about taking observations in your own um, area, your favorite walking spots, it sometimes helps me think about how my favorite dog walking spots change over the year by what I'm seeing um, throughout the year too. Um, and then if you are interested in more aspects of iNaturalist, and I, um, I, I do hope you are, iNaturalist itself has a lot of great additional resources. Um, there's great tutorial videos, um, like the basic, like how to make an observation, but then there's also like how to take a good photo because you want your photo to have identifying characteristics. Um, you can actually, one thing I forgot to mention is you can take multiple photos. So maybe a photo close up and a photo back. Um, there's lots of other um, resources for how to um, add your observations on a desktop computer and things like that. And there's, if you're um, interested in education, there's teachers, guides, and there's lots of different um, aspects to iNaturalist. So I'm happy to um, go over any of those with you. And lastly, oh, I actually have Science Fest down here to remind everybody that next Saturday is Mariah Mitchell Science Fest. We're participating in that as well. Um, we hope that you join iNaturalist and I'm, hope, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions that you might have and I think that is it for tonight, or for my part. <laughs> All right. I am gonna stop sharing. And then if anyone has any questions or if anyone has any particular comments um, or anything you'd like to share about iNaturalist, if you've tried it yourself, I'm, I'm open, my ears are open. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mary. Um, so just to wrap, while you're, um, while you're thinking, if you, do, if you don't have any questions, that's fine. But um, I think a, a good first step is to, um, sign up for iNaturalist, just, you know, kind of an easy, easy sign up, get the app on your phone, and then start playing around, start using it. Sometimes I use it to help with identification or to narrow something down for me, but I don't add it to the, you know, I don't necessarily add the photo. Um, so there is a separate app that iNaturalist makes called Seek that is, helps with identification, but I am a strong believer in using the original iNaturalist to really um, add to the biodiversity information. Um, yeah. All right, I don't think I have any questions.
Well, if anyone thinks of questions later, um, feel free to email me. Um, I am always open for conversations about biodiversity and iNaturalist. Um, I also am going to um, remember to email everybody about some possible field trip dates. I think the best way to really experience iNaturalist um, is to try it in the field. Um, it's fun to try it with something you definitely know too, because then it's a way for you to test um, how it might work. So if you go up to, um, you know, even if, well, I'm trying to think what would be up right now, the daffodils are coming up, but we don't really want to do daffodils, but even like a pine tree, that pitch pine, um, you can take, uh, you know, any of the shrubs like bayberry or something like that that you are familiar with. And if you try, um, oh yeah, holly is out right now. You know, it's the, any of the evergreens um, and you can see how that works and it's a good exercise to go through. Um, <laughs> Patricia, it's okay if you don't have a phone. Um, yes, dog vomit, slime mold. Just don't accidentally look, you know, look at real dog vomit, dog vomit, slime mold. Um, but Patricia, even if you don't have a phone, it's totally fine. If you have a camera of any sort, you can definitely take pictures. It'll just, there are a few extra steps um, to kind of um, know if your camera has uh, the date and time and then just knowing your location. So uh, you can um, uh, easily add things in on a desktop. We've had people, you know, people who have really nice cameras that take like telephoto lenses and things. We've had a lot of bird, like people um, add bird photos that are of that caliber and they'll do it on the desktop later. Um, and it's, you know, really great information, especially as long as you know the location. So thank you. All right, well, I wanna thank everyone again for being here tonight. We're um, keep you posted on potential future uh, field trip dates. I hope you um, sign up for iNaturalist if you haven't already. Um, and then also just keep in mind are some of our other events at the Linda Lori Nature Foundation Science Pub on Monday. And then in April, we're gonna be talking about phenology and nature's timing. So thanks again, everybody for being here and hope to see you again soon. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Kristen.